All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Ashley, and I'm CEO of NAFA Florida, headquartered here in Tallahassee. The first thing I'm gonna ask you to do is please mute your microphones. Please mute your microphones. And uh, if you'll do that now, that way that'll keep out all the ambient noise. We've got about 160 people registered for the class today. How do I mute my microphone? All right, hang on, let's just take care of that. All right, I've muted everyone. So the presenters, you might need to unmute yourselves, <clears throat> but uh, everyone else is muted. Thank you for that. If you will, please, please make sure that you keep yourselves muted and communicate uh, with today's presenters through the chat feature. We would appreciate that. Uh, we will have someone, um, Christiane from, the, uh, from Citizens will be monitoring the chat feature and passing the questions along to the presenters today. But uh, again, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, it's a delight to have you. And uh, NAFA Florida is delighted to host uh, this Power Hour uh, sponsored by Citizens today. Uh, before I introduce you to our state president, Craig Duncan, I just want to announce that NAFA Florida will be offering a five-hour continuing education class, the five-hour law and ethics class, on September the 28th at 9.30 a.m., and all members and non-members alike are welcome to, uh, to join that class. It's virtual, it'll be online. Uh, we, we're gonna start at 9.30, have a 30 minute lunch break and have you done by three o'clock. So uh, watch for registration information. If you wanna go to our website, if you're not a member, wanna go to our website, it'll be posted up there. We just put those details together this morning, as a matter of fact, right before we started this, uh, this uh, presentation here today. And uh, so we're gonna be putting the marketing together for that here in just uh, the next day or two. So that'll be available. Um, I'd like to introduce to you uh, our NAFA Florida president, Craig Duncan is a member of our NAFA Tampa Bay Association. He's a state farm agent out of Clearwater. And Craig, you've been a member of the uh, Citizens Roundtable for several years now, haven't you? Uh, I think since about maybe 2014. Terrific, all right. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to you and. Let you have a few announcements as well and a moment of welcome. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Craig Duncan, CHFC. Thank you very much, Tom. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome, NAFA Nation. Glad to have you on today. Uh, hopefully, uh, many of you are, are members of NAFA. If you're not, you need to be. Lawyers are members of the ABA, doctors are members of the AMA, and, and insurance agents should be members of NAFA. We protect your career in Tallahassee and in Washington, D.C and we bring along great educational opportunities like, like what we're presenting today. And it has been my pleasure to work with, with uh, citizens for, for many years, uh, going back to 2004 and 2005 when I was appointed to a task force after the uh, hurricanes to uh, help kind of redesign citizens. And, uh, and then I uh, got back onto the agents round table representing State Farm agents like I said, I think it was back in about 2014 and have represented State Farm agents since then. Uh, our member, Jim Leofow from the Panhandle represents NAFA for, uh, for uh, uh, the Citizens Roundtable. And it's been a great pleasure for me to work with the good folks at Citizens. Um, I can tell you that, uh, that Carl Rockman is as good as they can come by. Uh, anytime I have problems, I go to Carl and he fixes them just like that. Great guy to have uh, involved in Citizens. Uh, Marsha Watson on the agency size, I, I, I worked with her for a long time. And once again, great problem solvers and, and they're great resources to you as are your Citizens Agency managers. So uh, welcome to the, uh, to the NAFA presentation and Carl, I will throw it over to you. Greg, thanks so much. And thanks for your participation in our agent roundtable. And thanks everybody um, for coming in today. We have a citizen's message, but before I get started, the NAFA message, if you're a PNC agent in this marketplace and you're not involved in an association, you need to get involved. As Craig mentioned, the voice of the agent needs to be heard in this marketplace. And this association does a very effective job of making sure your interests are represented, you know, in Tallahassee with people like citizens, with other carriers. So I congratulate everyone that's taken time today to come through the NAFA channel uh, to listen to our message, but please uh, get involved. If you're a member, great. If you're not a member, get involved. It's never been more important that the voice of the agent get heard uh, in all different places uh, around the state of Florida. We've got a power hour for you. We're already five minutes into it, so I'm going to get it moving. We're going to talk about all things citizens today. 
Uh, joining me today um, is James Punday and Kelly Abel, who are two of our six great agency field managers. Um, I'm the Vice President of Agency and Market Services, so all things to do with the agent relationship at Citizens fall under me, including Clearinghouse and Depop, which we'll get into just a little bit today. But just so you know their voices, Jim, uh, can you say hello to everybody? Kelly, how about you? Just make sure we got a sound check. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And Jim, are you Good on morning. here? Good morning. morning. Okay, guys. Our contact information is here. Mine's on there. My phone number, my email, Jim and Kelly's email are also displayed. A lot of you are already working potentially with some of our field managers, um, but uh, consider us to be contacts for any follow-ups or things you have from today's session. Uh, Craig mentioned that he's a member of our agent roundtable. We want to acknowledge Craig's participation, but two other members, Jim LaFau, who Craig mentioned, uh, is the NAFA member for the art. Uh, and Lee Gordeski represents NAFA's interest on our Market Accountability Committee. Citizens is governed by governing boards. We have a board of governors that governs our actions, and we have a lot of subcommittees of which the MAC, Market Accountability Committee, uh, is really the agent's voice inside the halls and walls of citizens. The MAC relates to citizen senior staff, hold us accountable to make sure we're taking great care of agents and customers. Lee represents your interests there. And as Craig mentioned, Jim LaFau and Craig meeting with citizens as agent roundtable members five, six times a year and making sure that citizen staff gets it. Uh, we have, we've come a long way, but we have light years to go and we are not done. We are not stopping uh, in terms of improvements and getting things better for you and your customers. Uh, quickly also, I mentioned Jim and Kelly, but there's four additional members of the team. A lot of you on the phone already have relationships with these folks. If you don't, you need one. If you're starting to write citizens at any level, if you're starting to encounter a need for our capacity, uh, we are not the easiest to do business with, but once you crack the code, it can be a pretty good experience. These folks are seasoned professionals who can help guide you through uh, the citizens universe. They're not looking for a rollover. They're not a traditional marketing rep where they're gonna come in and ask you for business, but they are advocates for you. They are here to deal with you on a human level uh, and to make sure that you and your team are getting great support if you're out there suffering in silence with citizens at any level, let us know, because these folks can come in and do very prescriptive things, whether it's systems, underwriting, claims, communication, whatever it is, let these folks know. And by the way, they won't be shy if we see your name popping up on different things that we look at. Uh, we're not going to be shy about ringing your phone and we're ringing it to help. We're not ringing it because you're in trouble. We're ringing it because we want to get an edge to help you help your customers. All right. So please take our calls, open the emails when we send them. Very quickly, I'm gonna cover high level market conditions and then Kelly and Jim are gonna take you into some details that you and your team members will really value. But I think it's important when we get together, what's happening at Citizens, what's, what's going on? This slide is one that we share with our Board of Governors and our MAC and our ART. This shows you the significant number of agencies that have started to join Citizens over the past couple of years, right? We are up in agencies, we are up in agents and in licensed customer reps. An important stat is there's over 8,000 agents appointed with citizens right now. So 8,000 agents have the keys, 8,000 agents have the rates. That's a lot of competition. That's a lot of people uh, pressing on the customer. Our job, my team's job is to make sure that that's policed, that it's governed and that agents are getting the support they need. But if you're out there feeling the citizens uh, swing Know that other agents are and that we're having more demand to be appointed with citizens, uh, not just in regular areas like Tri-County, but all throughout the state. Another important piece, I'd ask you to take a look at your own agency and ask yourself, how much citizens business do you have? We break our agencies down by tier. We have 21 agencies that have more than 2,000 policies, okay? And we have 2,405 agencies that have less than 50. Okay, and everything in between. We're going to give you the same level of support regardless of your policies and force size, but know that as you start to climb the ladder, you're going to command more and more of our attention. And we would ask that you not become financially dependent on citizens. We don't want agencies to have thousands of citizens policies. It's kind of our mission, but just know that we do pay particular attention to your agency size. If we see growth spikes, we're probably going to come talk with you, make sure you're getting the help you need. And our goal is obviously to move. And if you're looking for the trends, in December of 20, we had 15 agencies with 2,000. Now we have 21. 
you can see the difference, the growth in citizens uh, from an agency standpoint. So if you're feeling it, you're not alone. A couple of quick slides on what's happening in the aggregate marketplace. This slide represents citizens' new business production, okay? So this is our new business coming in from those 8,000 agents across the state of Florida. The way to look at this slide, you'll see 13,710. That was the average amount of new business that we took in on a monthly basis uh, in these same four months of 2020. What's happened in 21, you can see the difference. We averaged 13,000, same four months in 20. In April of 21, we wrote 28,000. May, we wrote 30. June, we wrote 38. July, we wrote 34. We're up 141% in new business. A private company would kill for those results. We don't like these results. These results are not good for us. They're not good for the marketplace, but they do reflect a trend. More demand for citizens' products because of shrinking capacity with the carriers you represent. Our number one job, though, is to respond to this volume with great service and great support. But if you're feeling more citizens' intake, you're not alone. Okay, we're seeing it across the state. Um, not just in our product lines, but take a look at the, 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 uh, the areas across the state. You know, we're seeing growth, not just in South Florida, we used to average 9,000 a month. Now we average 17,000 a month in South Florida. But take a look at Tampa Bay, 1,100. Now we're up to 5,600 applications in Craig Duncan's neck of the woods. Look at Southwest Florida. Are you kidding me? Naples, Fort Myers, are you kidding me? No, 660. Now we're up to 2,700 apps a month from that neck of the woods, okay? Orlando, 408 up to 2,400. Guys, this is a seismic shift in the marketplace. We do not relish this. We are not trying to grow. We are not promoting citizens here, but we're trying to tell you and, let, and acknowledge that if you're feeling the shift, you're not alone as an agent. What do you do about it? Get great. Get great at citizens processing, get great at citizens processes and reach out for help because you're certainly seeing it out there and we're here to, to make sure that if you, if you need us for a short period of time, that we're doing it correctly. Quickly, what are we seeing? Okay, this is the coverage A volume, okay, that we're seeing come in at new business. And what's interesting about this, look at coverage A, 500,000 and above. Traditionally, that's not a citizen's market. High value homes have been a private marketplace for a long, long time, right? Take a look at 5% of our business is over half a million in A value. That's a lot of high value business coming in. And look at the age of home, 15% plus 2%, 17% of our business is under 20 years old, 2% is under 10. That's enormous, right? That's a lot of better quality business coming to citizens. This is a temporary phenomenon, hopefully. We're gonna to work to move it out. But nonetheless, we wanted to give you a sense of the shifting market. And then the other piece is where it's coming from. A lot of you represent these carriers. So this is the source of business. This is where our business is coming from. When you rewrite a customer who you've appropriately shopped in every market available and citizens is the only option for them given our eligibility rules. These are the big players, right? Universal PNC, FedNAT, People's Trust. This is where our business is coming from, okay? These companies are doing what? doing what's necessary for them to survive in the marketplace, taking back-to-back double-digit rate increases. It's creating shopping. It's creating calls to your agency for solutions. Regrettably and unfortunately, Citizens is becoming more and more of a solution for a lot of agencies, right? As long as it's done appropriately after all the shopping and all the eligibility rules are met, I'm here. But we got to make sure we're offering private market solutions to customers as much as possible where they're available to make sure the private market can stand up. But an interesting play and an interesting dynamic that we'd like to share with everybody in the marketplace, okay? One more slide, then I'm turning it over to Kelly and Jim for the details. You come to these power hours to get an edge. We're very, very conscious and cognizant of the disruption that citizens can cause in your agency when we make changes, when we do things, particularly as you're growing in citizens. So here's the road ahead for citizens for quarter three and quarter four, okay? These are the things that we're doing today that you wanna pay attention to that Kelly and Jim can help you understand, some of which they're gonna talk about. But the big things in quarter three, we are starting to take rate adjustments. We took rate adjustments effective 8-1. You're starting now to see your 8-1 renewals grind through rates, okay? We haven't taken rates in over two and a half years. 
So we are starting now to see rate adjustments in citizens. That might be a little bit of a change for some of your customers who've been with us a while. We need those rates. Our rates are capped. We are not able to take all the rate we want to from an actuarial basis, but we need to take as much rate as we can because it puts us closer to the private market. The biggest challenge we have is my rate is lower than it should be in a lot of areas, and it unfairly competes with the private market. We recognize that. But be aware, if you're holding 100, 200, 300, 1,000 citizens policies, you're starting to see now your phone's ringing, even your citizens rates are going up. If my rate can go up and get you closer to a private market, sell it, get them in the private market. It's an easier sell if I'm closer, okay? And if I'm not closer, we need the rate, okay? And we need your help to hold that rate in uh, and not try to do things to, to bring the rate downward if it's not appropriate, okay? Product changes, you'll hear more and more about this, uh, but we are making some modest product changes. Uh, nothing significant uh, in this space, but some minor ones that we've communicated. Our RCT tool, we did launch RCT Express, CoreLogic. A lot of you are familiar with CoreLogic. A lot of you've used it. That went relatively smoothly um, from an adoption standpoint, but, but we're getting ready to potentially load an inflation factor in on renewal. Okay, watch your mailboxes, please watch your mailboxes, please, because we have a, a thing coming on our CT that could potentially impact your coverage aid on renewal, and we want to make sure you're aware of that communications in the hopper, consider this a little sneak preview. The biggest thing you can take away from today's session, though, is what's coming on 929. On September 29th, we are going to push loss history reporting, clue reporting, A-star reporting, prior loss information. We're going to push it up to the point of sale. You are going to have the loss history report ordered for you in Policy Center and returned before you buy. So all the conversations that tend to happen after when our underwriters see the loss history reports after it's submitted, are going to end and we're going to push that information up front. What does this mean? I know all of you are rigorously interviewing the customer asking about prior losses. I know all of you are doing that and you're entering them into policy center. We're going to offer this extra layer of support where perhaps there's a lack of candor from the customer or maybe the customer bought the home and never knew. Doesn't that happen all the time, right? Regardless, you and your team are going to be empowered at the point of sale with a citizen's policy to see the loss history. You're going to be able to adjust it if the losses aren't tied to that customer, but clearly we're going to want to know why you're doing that and we'll be underwriting that. So watch your mailbox. We are going to shove out a 15 minute module that will educate you on all things around this from a policy center standpoint. It's going to be pretty easy. If you like it, keep it. If you don't like it, you can scrub it. That part's easy. But the other big piece to take away is proof of repair. There will be an algorithm and policy center. If the loss cause is this and the amount paid is this, policy center is going to prompt you for proof of repair at the point of sale right there. It's a big moment. Right now, the underwriters chase that. 40, 50 days into the underwriting review period. No one likes that experience. At least now you're going to be able to explain to your customer, you've had a water loss, it exceeded X amount, and Citizens is gonna require that I get proof of repair from you before I can proceed. Do I have your agreement, Mr. Customer? If you do, great. If you don't, <laughs> the show's gonna stop, right? Because we're gonna underwrite that. So I'm just giving this to you uh, from an awareness standpoint, we need your support here. All right, we get a lot of prior claim business. Pushing this up to the point of sale, we think is everyone's best friend versus what happens today, but we need your support. And I'm sure a lot of you are doing this with your carriers already. We're kind of late to the party in this space, but uh, hopefully everyone can understand the, the, the reason we're doing it and the why. Um, policy Center releases, little changes in Policy Center all the time. But the last thing, breaking news, just off the wire, not on this slide, uh, we are gonna be sending out notices of a depopulation. Florida Penn has been approved for depopulation, and those notices will go out tomorrow to agents that uh, are agreed have agreed to do a depop with Florida Penn. Number one, you must agree. And second, uh, you'll get your customer lists if they have chosen any of your customers uh, to make an offer to. So more to come on that. That's not for everybody. 
it's a small number of policies, but we wanted to let everyone know that you could potentially see some email on that over the next couple of days. Okay, so that's high level. If anyone had questions, please include them in the chat. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kelly and Jim, who are going to take you through the next content and some great messaging on other things with citizens. So, Kelly, Jim, take it away. Thanks, Carl. Um, one of the biggest things that I think a lot of agents need to take a look at, and uh, just as a kind of a brush up as well for their both their customers and for their you know staff inside their offices is a, a some resources that we do have available within citizens um, inside the uh, portal agent portal you can go to uh, ordering brochures um, i utilize this a lot for my folks down in monroe county they tend to order a lot of stuff on catastrophe aob things like that because we run into so much of that down in the in the florida keys especially with hurricane season uh, at least once a year, you know, we, we kind of circle back, see who's got, make sure everybody's got it stacked up with uh, enough brochures for their offices, make sure their customers are fully aware. This uh, information that we kind of developed over the last couple of years and the agents have taken advantage of down there has um, definitely reduced uh, the number the amount of litigation that we've seen out of Monroe County over the last few years. And it really helped us during Irma. So I encourage you guys to take uh, advantage of those. Um, they are free. You can go on that, that website. You can order them uh, direct, um, the free of charge. They'll send them directly to your offices. Um, they are uh, in English and Spanish in some of those. So take, take full advantage of those brochures when you get an opportunity and take a look and see what's on, on there as well. And you know we can also you can also put, download some of those as well. I saw somebody just put it in the chat here if they could be emailed. Some of those are are uh, PDF uh, versions, so you can definitely take advantage of that and send them out to your customers. Um, I've had a few agents actually upload that and send it directly to their customers, you know, into their uh, email databases. So th that's a great great point. Mm -hmm. Anything, Dad Kelly, on that or you think? Uh... No, no, Jim. I think you did a, a great job, yeah. and I I can't. Ex express how valuable these brochures are particularly there is one on the managed repair program as well yes. that is very valuable to have to help address that question on the application that comes up when the water coverage is limited the managed repair brochure is perfect for answering that Good so point. yeah okay next slide Thank you. next slide getting there hold on <laughs> <laughs> technical difficulty <laughs> before there you go All there up. it is okay and uh this is under a news section here so under this section here you'll be able to find any of the latest bulletins you might have missed uh sometimes you know i have agents sometimes they, they miss these i encourage everybody to at least take a look at this this section at least once a week uh, make it part of your you know weekly citizens checkup um, just go click on the news section you can pull up all the latest and greatest things that we've had and we've sent out and you know these things come out fast and furious and sometimes i know you get caught up in your day and citizens is uh at the bottom of your list so you know you got to make sure you at least check it at least once a week and uh, take a look at that and see what see what's going on with the happenings inside of citizens okay yeah. change jim i'm working it <laughs> I promise. Okay. So um, this is in uh, regards to the uh, the property inspections. I know some of you have probably have uh, gotten where your policy has been selected for a property inspection. This is a good breakdown uh, expansion of the property inspections of what what happens with these. And this is under that memo as well under the personal lines bulletin. Um, so the policy, you know, your policy gets selected for inspection. Um, the inspection is ordered by citizens with the, with the inspection company. Um, the agent is then sent an activity advising the, the inspection was indeed ordered. So you need to be checking your activities to see, you know, if you have any of those policies that may have been selected. Um, the notes placed on the policy and policy center that the inspection was indeed ordered. Um, the insured then receives a phone call from the inspection company to set up the inspection. So I think a lot of this has to do with the, you know, setting the right expectations with your customers that this could be a potential possibility down the road for, you know, a policy that could be, you know, indeed uh, selected for a property inspection. Yeah. The inspection company then would perform the inspection. Um, the results are then sent back to citizens for final review. Yeah. Hey, hey Jim. Yeah. A um, little, little commentary too on top of this. Um, we, we are going to be increasing exponentially <clears throat> number of inspections. Please yeah, don't yeah. look at this as just a reminder. 
we're sending this out to everybody, this bulletin and subsequent bulletins, um, we're moving from a very tiny percentage of our business to a significant amount of our business uh, that will be inspected. Now we're not doing that. We're not doing that guys for reasons that you might think we're doing it. One, we have to ensure the quality of this property. Number one, uh, we are taking business that might be <clears throat> considered marginal. We're not doing it to be difficult, but we're also doing it because we believe that the better quality of the inspection, the more chance we have of moving it to the private market through depopulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that everyone's attuned with the need for this inspection, the desire for it. Will we find marginal properties? Sure. Okay, that's what inspections are for. But believe me, we're doing this and investing this capital, not just to inspect purely for our needs, but also for the needs of our depop carriers and clearinghouse carriers who have a high desire to look at the quality of this property. Okay, we need everyone's support. And I'll, I'll throw Jim a little nugget here. Right now, the third bullet down, we send you an activity. Okay, if the underwriter orders an inspection, we get an activity. An, an activity, believe me, I, I know, I get it. They're not real visible. You're not in there every day. We already have on the board an improvement process. We're gonna send you an email and a signal, okay? It's coming. We get it because of the volume of inspections we're going to do. But the best thing you can do is prep your citizens customers at the point of sale, along with all the other messaging we're asking you for, like MRP and call me first. Citizens may order an inspection, okay? We may order one. Please pick up the phone please understand someone could contact you. And we may ask you guys to bridge in because customers aren't picking up their phone as often as they could or should, right? <clears throat> I'm sorry to step on that, but I want to make sure the messaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a good point. And, you know, I've had a point of contention with a lot of agencies and especially some of the bigger, you know, franchise operations that I deal with where we've had this, you know, you know, kind of like, you know, can, you know, point of contention with this, we, you know, complaining this and that, why do we have to do this? What, you know, what's going on with this, you know, and, and I circled it back to exactly what you said, you know, this, this makes the, uh, the whole file itself a, a greater potential to get resold and, and, you know, be able to sell it out on the market to another carrier. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. it just makes it that much better of a, of a piece of a policy that they may want to take. And the more information and the more stuff that we can get up front, it'll make it better for you in the back end. Yeah. And there's a potential for it to move out of citizens. So that's yeah. pretty much it in a nutshell, you know, and just and making sure you're setting the proper expectations with your customers at point of sale with this stuff. Um, when you move to citizens, I mean, this is this is part of the deal. So absolutely. And um, one other point that we'll move because I'm seeing some things in the chat. The guys, the issue here is citizens has an underwriting rule where we can't take homes with damage. It's a little, it's kind of a what do you mean? Citizens takes the damaged properties. No, we don't. We have an underwriting rule that says we can't. Yeah. Okay. So it's real important if, and, and I need to protect you from the other guy who's going to take the damaged property and find it, right? We need everyone's support. If the property has open, unrepaired damage, it is not eligible for you to buy. It. You are not allowed. It is ineligible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's be clear on that. Now, these inspections help us determine what the truth is. Okay. But know that we're doing this because we, for the reasons Jim articulated, okay? But get ready because exponentially each month, you're gonna see an increase or a gradual increase in the volume. And we wanna get really good at the uh, the communication, okay? Yeah. So, thanks. Okay, what else, Jim? Uh, this this bullet in here is in re regards to, I don't know if any of you had seen this or not. This is a retirement of the uh, dwelling property tenant forms. Uh, so there was a little bit of confusion I had with some of the agencies regarding this. Um, the retired policy forms on this was only the DP3 um, and the MP, uh, MDP one, uh, policy, the, the, the ones at the bottom there, they have not changed and you can still write these as, um, HO fours. <laughs> so that was in regards to that. I, I don't know if anybody else had any kind of issues with that. With, I just had a few phone calls last week in regards to that. And just, we just kind of wanted to circle back with that to make sure that everybody understood, uh, what was retired and what was not. So anything else on that, Kelly, you think you're. You're good with no, you no, yeah, just the DP3T is yeah. gone and the NDP1T yeah. is gone. Okay. Okay, let's talk about additional document requests. I'm pretty sure this is something all of you are familiar with. Uh, we have a document on the system that, and I'll show you how to get to it in just a second, but what this is designed to do, we did some research and we found the top five additional document requests coming out of underwriting have to do with four point inspections, photograph requirements, occupancy and use, loss history, and signatures. 
So what this document was designed to do is to help you cut down some of the rework that you're having to do on the, on the back end by doing some of this work on the front end. So if you look at four point inspections, I won't go through every single bullet, but if you look through the four point inspections, you can see there are some tips here that will help you like review the four point thoroughly, make sure it is within the 12 months, um, make sure that the photos match what the inspector has said and that the photos are clear. Same thing for photograph requirements. We need to make sure those are clear. If you see anything in regard to dirty pool water, you know, tree branches on the roof, things like that, you can go ahead and comment on the application either through the app remarks or through a note on the policy itself that you have addressed this with the customer and given them a certain timeline to take care of some of these uh, conditions. So you've got lots of tips there. Occupancy, this one is really common as far as an additional document request. And all we need is if you have a homeowner policy that has the, uh, at the, Mailing address is different from the property address. Just tell us why in the notes so that we don't write out and question it. And the other thing is on a DP policy, if the addresses are the same, just, to, just tell us why. So we wanna make sure that you have it written on the proper form. We do have some recommended e-learning attached to each one of these where you can go out. These are quick 15 minute vignettes that really give you a lot of information. So if we'll move on to the next two, they are loss history and signature requirements. Mm -hmm. yep. Anything to add there, Jim, before we move on? No, uh, I would just encourage everybody to take advantage of those courses that are, we do have available. Um, I did assign some of those out to um, some of my larger franchise operations, and they found it to be pretty beneficial to kind of like, you know, button things up with the stuff, especially uh, the verifying the insurability part. Right. I know a lot of the agencies, uh, some of the larger ones, they have, you know, like five or six different producers in the offices. And that really helps them kind of like, you know, understand what citizens is looking for with some of that stuff and avoid some of those like binding violations and things like that to come up from, from writing some of that business. Exactly. And that's what this document is designed to do as well is to help you give you tips on how to handle and for example, in loss history, what do you do when it's a closed claim? What do you do when it's an open claim? Um, all these tips really do help you prevent some re rework on the back end if you just take a minute to do things on the front end. And signature requirements, please, 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 please have those wind mitigation forms signed. That is by the customer. That is a performance violation. And we do need to have those forms signed in order to give the credits. And those forms need to be uploaded at the time of binding. Don't give a credit with an unsigned WinMIT form at yeah. the time of binding. So make sure that you're checking for that. And you know, that's you know, just this document is designed to give the tips. So now where do you find this document on, on the website? You can go, there are a couple of places, but you can go to training and then click on our personal job aids on the left-hand side. And then uh, over under resources on the right-hand side, it's the very first document under resources. We also have, I don't know if you've checked out our Agent Advantage blog, but when Jim was referring to the news section earlier, the Agent Advantage blog is on our news page and there's an article uh, written specifically for the additional document requests. So you can find the article there that will give you even more tips and it has a link actually in the article itself to the document. So this is a you know, great opportunity for you to really avoid some rework. I know Citizens takes a lot of time on the front end, but trust me, if you take a little bit more time on the front end, it'll save you a lot of, a lot of headache on the back end. All right, right now we're going to go ahead and pause for any questions. Christiane, do you have any questions in the chat box for us? We've answered almost all of the questions so far, Kelly, but we did have one question um, earlier when Carl was speaking um, regarding the coverage A limits that we currently have in place. We've, we've confirmed that the max coverage A limit is 700,000. Um, and 1 million for Miami-Dade and Monroe counties. But the question was, is there any word on increasing coverage A at this time? Uh, there is not, and it's a statutorily driven rule. So it would require 
legislative action to allow us to do that. Legislative action, though, is initiated through associations like this. It is not citizen staff independent judgment. We do not get to make that rule. We don't sit here and decide. We have to be directed by the legislature to change it. So, and we are aware, because Jim and Kelly, I think you're hearing it more and more now with home yeah. values increasing. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. know, know that we get it. Know that citizen staff gets it, okay? But there's nothing we're, we can do um, to change that. And when does the legislature meet? It meets once a year. You have a small window to make those changes. Tom Craig, I know your association is probably aware of the agent chatter on this, you know? Um, but nothing will change until we're directed uh, to do so through legislative change on that. So for those of you that are seeing your citizens renewals go above those thresholds and you don't have a market, I am not a solution for you. And I would say there's probably not any kind of change coming um, that, uh, you know, soon. So I would say plan accordingly. And the OIR decides when, the, when no market's available. So there also is a situation where the, in the OIR's judgment, you know, if there's markets available, then they, they tend to take a harder line on that rule, but the OIR also assesses what's the market availability. So a big, part of the, a big part of the calculus here is what are the markets doing in that space? And through this association, uh, we certainly can take that feedback where Tom, you know what to do with your OIR relationships, but this is a politically sensitive topic, guys. I think you get the citizens is a little bit of a box, but I want the folks on the line to know we don't independently decide. It's important for you to know we're governed by OIR and the legislature in this space. Um, and those rules are in place, at least for the short term. So hopefully that helps uh, clear up the question. And, and that would be the same for liability, correct, Carl? Correct. Or liability well, limits? The liability limits is, um, is not necessarily a statutorily driven thing, but that is, a, that is a, uh, a function of our decisioning in terms of availability in the marketplace and competitive position. So there's no changes coming uh, to raise us from 100 to 300,000 at this point. We will stick with the $100,000 liability cap. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. That was it for questions for now. Great. Okay. okay. Great. We'll be back. Keep them coming. Thank you. I'll turn the page and let Jim and Kelly take us to the next part. Okay. Um, as most of you are probably aware, uh, we sent out a bulletin dated June 11th that Citizens has enhanced the wind mitigation credit structure for homes built in or after 2002 to better address the variations in the requirements for wind loss mitigation in the Florida Building Code. The enhancement is effective August 1st and affects homeowner uh, 3, HO3, HO8, and HW2. So I wanted to take a minute to share with you a couple of things that, that go along with this. We have revised our wind mitigation feature help chart, and it's this is one page of probably six or seven pages designed to help you know what to put in the wind mitigation fields, wind loss mitigation fields on Clearinghouse uh, as you go through a new policy. And the it's set up by year built, so you'll find the year built at the top and then go down the columns for what you will put in the different fields. Now, if you will notice, uh, down toward the bottom, it says FBC wind speed. Before, you didn't have to calculate the wind speed or input anything as far as wind speed goes for policy center or clearinghouse. Well, that has changed with these changes. So, Carl, if you'll move to the next slide for me. I will try. <laughs> what um, We do have some job aids out there that will help you. So if you click on your FAQs in the, in the green bar at the top of the website and enter 4294 as your code, it will pull up a document on how you determine the wind speed value. There's a new website that you will have access to. And when you pull up this job aid, it will give you the website link. So you can click on it from the job aid. And when you get into, uh, uh, also there is another um, code WLM, which will pull up that chart that I just showed you. So in FAQs, you can use 4294 to determine how you put in the wind speed. And then for the wind loss mitigation chart, you can use WLM as your search tool. And that will pull up the guidance and the grid for 
the new changes in the wind loss mitigation fields. They pretty much go by the wind loss mitigation form if you have one. If you don't, then it will tell you what to put in to determine any types of credits as you're quoting. So on the next slide, I just wanted to give you a sneak peek at what the ATC website looks like. You will go into the website, type in your property address, and then based on uh, the year built, if it was built in 2012, for example, you would use the risk category two and the ASCE seven through 10 section. And then, uh, well, I kind of have that backwards, ASCE, ASCE seven through 10 section, and then the risk category two. And that's how you would enter your wind speed. So it depends on the property, depends on the year built, but that job aid that I mentioned earlier will guide you through that. Jim, Carl, anything else to add here? Yeah, that seemed like it buttoned up a lot of things for my agents that they had a little bit of issue with, this, especially Tri-County Monroe that we're running through some of this stuff. And, you know, we had to kind of, we found some glitches early on when this thing first came out mm -hmm. and uh, that helped, uh, you know, kind of circle back, get things fixed and everything's good now. So I haven't really heard too much out of this after, you know, these two things came out and we sent it to the agents. They seem like they, they got the hang of it now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also- and this Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Carl. Just add one more thing, Kelly. On this, we also are looking at a solution that wouldn't require you to go out to this alternate website. Mm -hmm. A lot of you are familiar with Pi West, where you get the information. We're really looking to integrate this experience with Pi West. Okay, yeah, so good watch point. for that good in point. the future. We do get that this is a little clunky, but boy, get after these features because there's rate there, right? And it Kelly makes a difference. It. Yes, it does. It does. It does. Absolutely. It makes a difference. Yep. Okay. okay. Any okay. questions? Yeah, we'll pause another second for some questions on that. But we did have one question come in. I believe this might be for you, Carl, and it has to do with Gulfstream policies. Okay. Um, we have some clients taking advantage of the Gulfstream delaying of inspections due to time constraints yeah. and the urgency of getting the policies in. Yeah. Um, the question is, will there be any considerations given to these policies to extend the time to complete the inspections? Right now, you pretty much have the underwriting review period at your disposal. We're just now getting through the second wave of Gulfstream. I would recommend to any agent out there notes to the underwriter on the current condition, the current status of the customer's commitment to make those repairs is your best friend. Keep your underwriters posted. Keep your underwriters informed. Uh, we do understand the, the Gulfstream situation is a little precarious. Those folks were not given a lot of warning. You're going to see us give great consideration to folks that have special circumstances but please notate those notes in the file so the underwriter can see that you're actively engaged working with that customer. But the general answer is yes, we are going to be working with you throughout the underwriting review period to give you appropriate time to get the inspection in. For most of you, that's 89 days from tomorrow or the next day. So we have some time to work through that. Um, and that would be my advice, but keep your underwriters engaged and informed as best you can for, for some of those special circumstances customers. Okay. All right. And that was the only question for now. Yeah. Christy, I think there was one other question um, looking at the, we did address that. I'm sorry. Okay. On the higher limit. So we're good. Okay. okay. Um, Kelly, I think there's a little more slideshow here. We want to get Just to. a little bit. Yep. Jim, I think this one's over to you. Okay. Yeah. This is this. Uh, this is on the slide on the new replacement cost estimated the RCE. Um, this also is under training. Um, you'll find uh, on-demand education on this. This uh, the Core Logic RCT Express. I know a lot of the agents have taken advantage of this already, uh, but we just kind of wanted to circle back with this, make sure that everybody was aware. I think when we first rolled it out, there was a little bit of you know again a little bit of clunkiness with understanding how it works, things like that. This uh, really helped uh, the 10 minutes is well worth just taking it, um, getting your staff to take it in. Anybody that's just got license within your offices, make sure they do take advantage of this. This is another little 10 minute little thing that'll save you a lot, a lot of time uh, at the front and uh, in less problems on the back. So <laughs> you do take advantage of that. And as well, you know, you'll find additional web webinar recordings on on all these uh, courses as as well. It's not just this, but uh, you can go down the list here, and you'll find anything that you might possibly need or or you know be looking for if staff has questions in your offices. Yeah, one thing I'll point out here, Jim, on the RCT Express um, modules, are the if you are using um, or if you're writing a lot of mobile homes. 
there are a couple of little quirky things that are uh, specific to mobile homes, such as setup fees and the depreciation. So this course that walks you through the mobile homes will cover all of that for you. So you definitely want to take a peek at that if that's been something that's caused me a little bit of heartburn. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> I know you had you had some of those mobile homes, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> a lot of my agents have mobile yeah. homes. So, yeah. good deal. This is uh, the personal job aids uh, that you'll find as well. Um, I have a lot of the uh, the kind of set up a process in, in in a lot of the agencies that I do business with that we put together, where they'll actually print off a number of these uh, personal job aids, especially with their onboarding of new staff. Um, I kind of made it a recommendation that, you know, coming in, if you're hiring new staff, make sure you, you visit this page um, under the general section and personal job aids and, and print off as many of these that you, you know, depending on what kind of business your agency is going after, um, you know, you can curtail it to whatever you want, you know, make it, make it, what make it what you want, but everything we have here resource wise, it's here, it's for you. And it's, uh, you know, it definitely will help you make your citizens ex experience a whole lot better. Okay, excellent. All right, we are coming in for a landing. Uh, Jim and Kelly, thank you so much. My we, pleasure. We are making really good time. We do have some time for some additional questions. Um, I do have a couple that I think Christiane's going to read out in a minute. This will give everyone else on the line a chance to throw a question in the chat. We'd be happy to address live or circle back with you uh, right after this session if possible. But that kind of concludes the messaging we wanted to get out today. Christine, I think there's a couple questions in the chat, at least one relative to the Gulfstream that I saw come in if you want to. Yes, mm -hmm. there is another Gulfstream question. Um, the question is, do we know if Gulfstream customers will get a refund for policy periods that extend after August 27th? Um, I'm not the Gulfstream spokesperson, so I will I will temper my statement here by, by that at the top. Uh, we do know Gulfstream is obviously under receivership. The receiver controls. The, the idea is if premium is due to those Gulfstream customers, it should be payable within 60 days of the insolvency. I would say watch your email, watch closely what happens there. Uh, but I'm not in a position to speak for the receiver or for, you know, for that particular process. But we were informed generally that it was going to take some time to get those refunds out in good order. Could take as much as 60 days generally. That's where some of these customers are in a tough spot where they need to fund a new policy but don't have the old. We get that. But, uh, but I would think generally if refunds are available um, that they would be forthcoming. But the receiver would be the best source of information for that. And we're, we're certainly happy to represent that question and you know, communicate back through Tom if we need to. Okay. Any other questions in the chat, Christine? No, no, no additional questions have come in. Okay, excellent. Well, Tom, I think uh, generally then, um, I would just say to the agents out there, uh, we are here to assist you and we are here to help you. Uh, Kelly and Jim represent a team of six professionals that are standing by uh, to consult with your agency at any level on operations, underwriting requirements, advocacy. And again, we won't be shy about reaching out to you. Tom, I, I mentioned that because we look at a lot of things internally. And if we see an agent struggling with something, we're reaching out. We're saying, can we help you better understand? We're doing that because if, if, if the agent's really the linchpin to this, if the agent isn't getting the support, the downstream impacts on the customer and us are, are dramatic. And so we want to avoid that as much as possible, understanding that we can be a little bit tougher to work with. Uh, because of requirements and because of who we are. So we'll acknowledge that nonetheless, but we are all about uh, helping agents navigate uh, through those channels and getting that done. And I'm trying to flip back to the last slide for those of you asking me to flip it, I'm trying, uh, but unable to stand up the, uh, the field manager piece. So um, with that, everybody, Tom, I think we are at a concluding, um, there is a question um, about getting the slides. Tom, we can make these slides available to you. They're all approved. So we can uh, post those for those that are interested. Great content here. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, information for the agencies to take back. And uh, we'll sort of make that available. Terrific. The Thank you. We can get them out. Uh, send, it, send the request to me here or through, uh, through citizens as well, I guess. Absolutely. Okay. So, Tom, we appreciate the time and the attention and the partnership with your great association. I'll mention again to the agents, get involved. At some level, get involved. Because your voice uh, is very, very important to the industry, and uh, we certainly encourage it. So, Tom Craig, we thank you so much for the access to your great members and, and guests, and uh, we look forward to doing this again in a couple of months.
Thank you very much, Carl. We appreciate your uh, participation and we appreciate everybody in the organization that, uh, that joined in today. Thank you for supporting NAFA and thank you for supporting uh, citizens. Uh, Tom, any wrap up comments? No, that's good. Thank you, Carl and your team. Fabulous job. We just really appreciate it. I'll echo uh, Craig's comments as well. But great job. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.